Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased today, and I, I thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to speak um, about this um, small expert workshop that we did in 2016 on dietary fibers and prebiotics, including shikari root fiber and human gut microbiotic composition and microbiome. Um, essentially, I, I work for Census, which is producing shikari root fibers, um, and also my colleague, former colleague, Dietrich Meyer. Um, but the other authors have no real conflict of interest in this. It was quite um, an academic exercise. Um, where do I come from? Um, Census is a cooperative um, uh, within the Netherlands owned by farmers and basically they are uh, producing uh, sugar beets and potatoes and other products. Um, and Census um, itself is focusing on various sugary root fiber ingredients and powders and syrups and you've heard earlier today um, about um, benefits from, from um, this prebiotic and, and other new potential benefits. So the workshop was conducted um, in Chicago in 2016, as I mentioned, um, and essentially we, we focused really um, on human subjects, not to take away from excellent in vitro um, and animal work, um, but because this is already very broad, and we basically discussed the research and approaches, um, and notably uh, uh, sequencing technologies which are used to study the effects of fibers and prebiotics on gut microbiota, um, looking at the different capacity for these technologies, um, is there more behind the specific bifidogenic effects for certain prebiotics, and where might it be going in the future in terms of leading to regulatory acceptance for a gut microbial uh, biomarkers for fibers especially. Um, just a brief reminder, um, uh, we have a, a very important organ within us which we uh, basically inherit from our mothers and of course there's quite an influence in shaping it on genetics, um, diet, medicines can influence it, environment, um, besides having direct effects on our gut, um, there's also systemic effects in the body, as you've heard today, on weight management, glucose homeostasis, um, and, and more recently also, for example, mental health and mood. It's important to have it all in balance. Um, and here there's an opportunity, of course, via our food, good food, uh, fibers, prebiotics, to, to modulate it in a positive way for our health. Um, there's very nice initiatives going on in the world in terms of really studying the human gut microbiota, um, notably the Nas National Institute of Health uh, funded Human Microbiome Project Consortium, which really was a very significant framework uh, for the whole microbiome field. Um, and in uh, Europe, there was the European Commission funded Metagenomics of the Human Intestinal Tract, where they sequenced something like 124 individuals and found out there that the genes of the human gut are maybe something like 150 times more than, than the humans. Um, and, and there's sort of a, an overall coordinating project, the International Human Microbiome Consortium, at times very active and then at times quieter, all working towards an understanding um, of human physiology. Um, it's almost risky to put a list, um, but certainly there are various gut microbiota initiatives going on on every continent um, in the world currently. Um, and for example, the American Gut Project, you can send in your fecal sample to be sequenced um, and you can send lifestyle and dietary records and they will compare that to um, compare that to other, other um, sequenced microbiomes. Um, and this is going to be you know, very, very important to build that kind of database to understand better this whole field. Um, just very briefly, because it's been dealt with also earlier very nicely by Kelly Swanson, um, but you know, we, we started with plate counting where we felt there was ver a very sort of filtered view because now we know and have the availability um, of the 16S ribosomal RNA as a universal phylogenetic marker. Um, and also the nice to <clears throat> next generation um, sequencing technologies. Um, I mean, culturing is still important and, and there is indeed cultural almost going on where apparently now with the, with the recent Nature paper of Brown, you can indeed probably culture most microbes using all sorts of tricks like co-cultivation and that. Um, but the next generation sequencing technologies really allow us to look quite globally. They're becoming more cost effective. They're becoming faster. Um, so besides looking at phylogeny, you can also use these various techniques to look at the genes, the, um, the, 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 the uh, um, metabolites, um, the proteins, um, and also the messenger RNAs, which are all telling you very, uh, very relevant um, information to try to bring the whole ecosystem together. 
Um, it's almost impossible to try to say and put the human microbiome on a slide, um, and nonetheless I, I attempted for my own sim simplified self. <laughs> um, but it, it would seem that there are sort of enterotype-like clusters, um, and, and over 5,000 adults have been investigated, and you could be more the Bacteroides or Prevotella or Ruminococcus. Um, this enterotype is still controversial also. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> okay, no, stay here, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, so, um, and, it, and it's not really clear why these enterotypes um, are existing. Um, and some people believe maybe, in fact, that they're more moving from one to the other. Um, and also there's been some very nice work done where uh, various research groups are looking towards, well, what is actually the core microbiota present um, in persons? And again, there's very nice research going on in this field. And this was a piece from 2017 where they looked at over 1,000 subjects. Um, and they could um, identify, uh, for example, from a hit ship with 1,000 possibilities of bugs um, and, and let's say 130 taxa, they could find about 34 taxa present within about 95% of a population of 1,000 subjects. And top ones in there, for example, are the Fecalobacterium prasnitzai, Ruminococcus, um, but also Bifidobacteria here, um, Acromantia here. <clears throat> so, so this is, um, you know, starting to give some indications, but nonetheless, um, you know, despite some similarities with us, we all have a different gut microbiome. There still isn't really um, a definite um, definition um, of a healthy gut um, microbiome yet, and many functions of the human gut microbiota have not really yet been um, um, uncovered. Um, we then did overviews um, of, uh, of different types of prebiotics and fibres on the human gut microbiome. It's not the idea that you should look at this detail at all. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's just to say that we gathered studies. Um, there's quite some studies being done with the older techniques like DG, qPCR, FISH. Um, and there's less studies done with, let's say, more novel technologies like high-throughput sequencing and hit shipment microarrays. So there's definitely more work requires to be done. Um, but what does come out indeed, indeed, is the, is the strong bifidogenic effect of fructan prebiotics. Um, and sometimes you see, um, and that's seen not only with the old culturing technologies, that's also clearly identified with all the new technologies. Um, and sometimes you also see other effects. In some cases you see Fecalobacterium prasnitzai, but not always. So, you know, there could be other effects here, maybe doses or individual microbiota playing a role. Sometimes bacteroides tend to get a bit reduced. It's speculated that this might be the high acetate, uh, uh, or high lactate produced uh, by the bifidobacteria, which might affect the bacteroides. <clears throat> so, so more work to be done. Um, but these um, techniques can um, be, be used to, to look at very sort of curious questions. Um, and in this particular piece of work, which was done by um, Sebastian Timms from Wageningen, um, he looked um, at a study um, which used oligofructose in a healthy men, a high dose, 20 grams, and he looked at co occurrence networks of gut microbiota. So here is the placebo, and here is oligofructose. And the question we were looking at here was bifidobacteria we know produce lactate and acetate, and this is going to be very critical to the bifidogenic uh, effect and to the, let's say, the health benefits um, of these particular um, prebiotics. But there's also a certain level of butyrate produced, um, but you don't really easily see those butyrate producers. Um, and this co-occurrence network could give some indication of where they might be. So these blue parts mean there's no real change between placebo um, and the oligofructose. But the green indicates, um, there you see connections, positive connections. And, and essentially what comes out here when you look at these groups is you see um, acetate butyrate producers and lactate butyrate producers have all been increased um, also significantly. Um, but they're quite a diverse group. Um, so this is probably why you don't see them easily um, if, you, if you look alone with something like FISH or, or QPCR. <clears throat> we also looked um, at other oligosaccharides, for example, like galacto-oligosaccharides. These seem to have also, you know, quite um, a, a bifidogenic effect. Um, Arabinozylan oligosaccharides um, and also xylo-oligosaccharides. But sometimes there seems to be yeah, differences um, yeah, de depending um, on whether they're, for example, in, depending on the matri matrices that they are present in, for example, in this case. Um, and also there was a study done with partially hydrolyzed aguargum, which gave a very, very diverse effect. 
So in some cases, the oligosaccharides seem to give more towards a bifidogenic effect, especially for the uh, fructans. Um, but nonetheless, there are still relatively limited, let's say, global 16S studies being done so far. Um, bifidobacteria, of course, does such a, have a very large capacity for carbohydrate metabolism, which might explain uh, why it comes out strongly in these studies. Um, and that, that is also curious then that there's not always a, a clear relationship between the chemical structure and the effect on the microbiota, which was already noted by uh, Professor Hamaker in earlier, <coughs> in earlier studies. We also looked, um, gathered um, from Scopus, LC database and so on, glucose-based polymer fibers on the human gut microbiota. Again, it's not the idea that you actually have to read through all this list. Um, but for exam examples here are resistant starch, non-starch polysaccharide, wheat bran, uh, polydextrose, soluble corn fibers. And here there start to be also some studies done with uh, pyrosequencing um, or with microarrays or with aluminous sequencing. Um, in this case, um, uh, notably for the resistant starch, there seem to be um, often st uh, stimulation of the ruminococcus species, no notably ruminococcus uh, bromide. Um, and apparently that is, has been linked to, um, with, with other studies to, to resistant starch breakdown. Um, but in general, the effects tended to be a bit broader from the studies that, that are published so far. Um, but but it's, still, it's still relatively early in terms of the number of studies done in this field. <coughs> Um, th there's also growing awareness that, um, th th that, that there seems to be kind of a difference in response um, of one's gut microbiota um, in any case to, to fiber diets or prebiotic diets. Um, and this is shown in this particular example here. Um, it was a study initially done by Walker et al. in 2011 where they had a diet with resistant starch and non-starch polysaccharide wheat bran and also a weight loss diet in obese adults. Um, and they showed, here it was shown by principal, microbiota principal coordinate analysis after, um, after hit chip. Um, these long arrows here, they, they're showing the dietary response depending on, on what kind of diet was involved for a particular individual. And if it's long arrows, basically there was um, a large dietary response. And in the, the small arrows is where there's actually a very small response. So you can see you have uh, really responders and sort of non-responders. Uh, to, to various uh, fibre diets, um, and it would seem that the non-responders seem to have a higher diversity um, of microbiota, and there is some sort of theories and concepts growing that perhaps if you have a higher diversity of microbiota, your microbiota has sort of more resilience to react to challenges. <clears throat> Um, and this has been taken somewhat further in another study, um, where in this case there was uh, three different interventions of obese adults um, um, taken again for uh, and looked at again by HITCHIP. So the, there was a study from the United Kingdom um, using resistant starch and non-starch polysaccharide in Belgium, inulin oligofructose diet, and in Finland a study with high fiber bread and whole grain pasta. Um, and again, it was possible to separate them out into responders and non-responders, but in, in this case they took it a step further and it really seems that it might be possible to make some uh, predictions um, based on your baseline microbiota um, to the impact um, of diet on certain metabolic markers, at least in these obese, in, in, in these obese subjects. Um, and of course, this is just proof of principle work, uh, but nonetheless, it, it would be very nice if this kind of work is possible <clears throat> going forward, uh, especially for fibers, but notably for diets in general. Um, uh, finally, we also made a collection um, of studies on mixed fibre diets um, on the human gut um, microbiome. Um, and indeed here, there was a, in general more, um, more gut microbial richness, which is uh, along the lines that we heard today, that it would be good to have lots of fibres in the diet um, from different sources. Um, what was also noticeable, although there's very few studies done yet, was um, the impact, for example, on limiting fibres in the diet, like FODMAP diets they may potentially have, a, 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 they may cause a decrease in diversity, for example, in this particular, in this particular study here, and there was actually a decrease in diversity of many types of microbes. So some, some, some caution also when we are changing um, our diets. <clears throat> um, so the, in terms of perspectives, um, certainly there's um, a very nice array now of sequencing technologies to monitor effects of uh, fibers um, and prebiotics on the gut microbiome. Um, 
and, and it could be that even fibre maybe has some of the greatest effects on microbiota when it comes to foods within the diet, uh, because they are really food for the microbiota. Um, there's, there's some indications that, uh, that the specific baseline gut microbiota of individuals might be able to be used to, be predict, to, to predict the response to fibre diets regarding metabolic health. Um, um, nonetheless, as mentioned, there are systemic approaches, good, good systematic um, approaches required to these studies to have really good quality. Um, apparently, whether you use, for example, physical methods or chemical methods, you may get differences in outcome with your studies. Um, uh, certainly novel diagnostics, there, there are companies starting to, to look in this area to, to look for kind of mass, mass population monitoring, um, which would be quite fascinating um, and very useful for consumers potentially in the future. Um, uh, funding initiatives caring about world health can continue to accelerate this field. Um, it was reckoned that it could still be quite some years uh, before this research will be at such a level that it could be really accepted by regulatory authorities um, for health claim. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of interest in that and, and so it's certainly heading in that direction. So, thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, any question? We have time for questions. Okay. Mm. No.